Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. And I have with me today uh, my friend Alan Zundel, who is, um, well, Alan, maybe you can tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. <laughs> okay. I don't know who I am, but I can tell you a little about my life story and how I came to be interested in the political economic scene. Go way back to the 70s. I was living in Detroit, and I saw the decline of the auto industry under pressure from international competition and oil prices and things like that. A lot of my friends were getting laid off a lot from work, and, and you could see how the economy was changing in ways that politicians didn't really know how to deal with. And that eventually led me back to college. I was a college dropout for about 10 years, <laughs> went back to school later in life, and uh, then went into graduate school, first learning about political theory, which is a glorified name for political philosophy, a lot of interest in socialism and how the economy worked and how politics and economics intersected, and then later on work in public policy. So I was a, a political science professor for about 10 years, and then I left that about 15 years ago. And since then, I've been doing various things. But a lot of my work has been around trying to change election systems because I see that as a key uh, thing that needs to change in order to proceed further with any kind of meaningful social advance, which is the name of the organization <laughs> you and I are both trying to get off the ground. Yes. OK, well, we'll get back to social advance uh, in a little while. But um I want to sort of start out by talking the last week I had on uh, Cliff Wilming, who is a, an activist and a union member. And he was talking about a recent article he'd written on uh, what are the things he sees on the ground as an activist that are blocking movements and that are keeping people from from actually making some progress. Or, um, we talked about the uh, various movements we see seeing across the world, Lebanon and Chile and Ecuador and Haiti and various other places around the world. We're seeing massive demonstrations of people in the street day after day demanding a change in their government uh, away from the neoliberal policies. But we don't see anything like that here. Now, Cliff, Cliff's perspective on this were that there were three key reasons that he saw, you know, as an activist. One was um, what he called the nonprofit industrial complex, the, uh, the foundation funded nonprofits that tend to um, uh, end up directing uh, the movements. Uh, the labor union leadership, which essentially directs everything back to the Democratic Party, regardless of whether the Democratic Party is helpful. And, of course, the Democratic Party itself, because so many of the movements end up being a uh, little more than get out the vote for the Democrats, any old Democrat. So I was kind of hoping that as a political scientist, you might give us a little bit more, more of a macro view of this uh, or a theoretical view that would help us kind of understand more about why we're not seeing uh, a revolution in the streets. Well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Essentially, what he was talking about is institutions that deflect energy into um, activities that don't really address the heart of the problem. And to me, the heart mm -hmm. of the problem is capitalism. Uh, unless you have a way to directly address what it is about capitalism that, that uh, generates all the social problems that we are trying to address, uh, you won't be able to get very far. And the key to that, of course, is the way the, the two-party system is constructed, and the Democratic Party becomes de facto the party that's slightly to the left and absorbs all these energies, but won't address the key problem. Uh, another problem that he really didn't mention that I think is very different here from other countries is just the scale geographically of the United States. Right. How do you get masses of people together to, to converge on the capital? The people who are hurting the most can't like we're in Oregon. You can't take a, a person who's living in their car and get them out to Washington, D.C. to demonstrate in the streets for weeks waiting for the government to fall. They just don't have the means to do that. And the people that are getting by, they're doing OK. They've been programmed to think, well, you got the right to vote. That's the proper way to get change. Use your right to vote, organize, run for office, find better candidates, whatever. But the political system, the electoral system is constructed to resist 
fundamental change. One of the problems I find too is that there's a big restriction in the kind of information that people are allowed to have. Oh, yeah. uh, the media really does not present us any options other than the two political parties, uh, both of which are capitalist parties. I mean, mm -hmm. who really are devoted to retaining the system as it currently is constituted. So it doesn't really give people an idea of where they might go. Is that kind of what you're saying? Well, that's, that's part of it, too. Um, people need some sense of what it is we're trying to achieve in order to focus their energies uh, and, and in an organized way. And if, if your focus is let's get a Democrat into office, that's easy to conceive of doing, hard to do sometimes, <laughs> but it's yeah. easy to see it. But what is the greater goal? What is it you want that Democrat to do once they're in office? And you don't get a story about a larger story about capitalism. And if, if you've looked at this hard enough and come to the view, as I have and I assume you have, that unless you address capitalism uh, itself, you're, you're really not going to change things. So how do we inform people about this? How do we make people think about it differently? How do we expand their mental horizons to think that uh, socialism does, just doesn't mean you know, putting Stalin in charge of things and uh, taking away all your political rights? Uh, what does socialism mean? today. So you need alternative media to be able to talk about those things and reach people with new perspectives, give them a different vision of what they're trying to achieve, um, a conversation about that so they can participate in constructing that, and ways to move toward that. I mean, I don't see, however, in a lot of the countries right now where we're having uh, protests, I don't know whether they have any particularly more uh, knowledge about socialism than we do. Uh, and I look at some of these countries like Lebanon, for example, which was under the Ottoman Empire and then under the French and then has this this highly corrupt sectarian uh, government imposed on them by the French. I mean, how do they, uh, but they're really like all out there saying, like, you know, they want uh, something, this, they don't know what. They, wa they want something and they don't know what. And I think that's kind of true yeah, of a lot of the groups. Too, too. Yeah. The yellow vests, uh, you know, probably the people in Chile. I mean, they, they know what they don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I put all the people that supported Donald Trump in the same category. They are willing to tear the system down, and they're not sure what's going to replace it. They just know that what they've had so far is, for one reason or another, intolerable to them. To some right. extent, it's about their economic position being precarious. To some extent, a lot of cultural issues get involved in the way it's presented to them. But it's the same kind of thing. People just know things aren't working well for them, and they are willing to do anything <laughs> to make a change. They just don't, they're not sure what they, right. what they want in replacement. So what yeah. they usually get is either chaos or just a new government that does something very similar to what the last government did. In 2008, you know, we saw... Uh, Barack Obama promised hope and change, but didn't produce hope and change. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then we had uh, Hillary Clinton back in 2016 telling us that really everything was okay, and what we needed was four to eight more years of uh, of the Obama administration, you know, under her leadership. Uh, that didn't take. That was not really well received, apparently. Yeah, not by everybody. <laughs> but no. By enough people that uh, you know she won a majority. It's just our election system didn't uh, doesn't honor majorities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's even worse than that. I mean, people focus on the president. Usually, every couple of years the presidential race gets started, uh, but now the presidential race goes on for four years at a time, oh, exactly. and everybody's paying attention to who's going to be the next president rather than anything else they could actually be doing to to institute change at a local level and build on that. I mean, we have. As individuals, we have very little power to determine who's going to be the next president. But uh, there's, there's also the problem that once you get a president in office who's supposedly going to do good things for you, then they complain about you need a Congress that's going to work with them. So now we need to elect more Democrats to Congress. Oh, we lost the Senate. Let's get the Senate back. Now we've lost the House. Let's get the, Now we've lost the president again. Let's keep moving around <laughs> to try to get more Democrats. And then eventually we'll have enough in there. There, they're not going to go in the direction that you think they need to go. No, I mean there there are enough Democrats, but they're not, uh, if you will, the right kind of Democrats. I mean, you know what we're doing uh, 
you know, a lot of the Democrats that were elected uh, last year in, uh, you know, in great hope uh, were were very much neoliberal, uh, you know, mm-hmm. warmongering Democrats who aren't really going to do anything. You know, pro-capitalist Democrats. They're they're going to keep doing the same things, and we we really don't see the change there. But you know, I think we have to talk a little bit more about that whole thing because again, we end up with a situation where uh, we could blame the Democratic Party for that's having. Fun. Yeah, that's fine. That doesn't really get us much of anywhere, though. But no. how do how do we break out of this? I mean, you're you've been involved in, um, you know, in a movement toward uh, star voting, uh, which basically is a ranked choice type system, right? Um, ranked choice. It's more of a scoring system than a ranking. Yeah. System. yeah. So basically, we score each candidate. I don't know, one through five or something, and then uh, the candidate that gets the highest score wins yeah. Yeah. and uh which is which is different from our first past the post um mm-hmm. you know thing that ends up electing people who you know almost half of the people don't like and, but, and good part of the other half is not the crazy about them either they just thought they were better than the other one yeah and we, we can't keep doing that we we are encouraged to vote uh in a strategic way to ensure that the mm. other guy who is awful, who is practically mm. Hitler, uh, does not win. Uh, and so we end up with somebody who isn't that other guy who is on our team, wearing our team colors, but really isn't fighting for us. And it, and it suppresses the uh, any third parties that arise. You know, I've seen this cycle. We're both old enough to have seen this cycle over and over again. You have people getting disgusted with the Democratic Party. They turn to a third party like the Green Party or uh, in the past, there's there been other parties similar to that. What was it? The Peace and Freedom Party in mm-hmm. California or something like that, or the People's Party or one thing or another. But when you find out that voting for that third party actually helps um, a party you didn't, you least wanted to win, win, then people get the solution with that. Parties can't grow if they don't have an actual opportunity to get somebody into office. Um, And and when you have a system of voting where you get to say yes to only one candidate, that's automatically a no to every other. And all the candidate needs is more votes than anyone else. They don't need an absolute majority, let alone, uh, you know, the consensus from the entire electorate. Uh, Then you produce a system where people have to aggregate into the largest mass possible. And the only way you can aggregate in a large mass is by watering down your message so it appeals to many people as possible. Right. In Europe, they have more parliamentary systems, depending on which country, which allows for new parties to arise and come in and gain, like the Green Party is getting seats in right. the, the European Commission and in some countries. And they can use that as a platform to educate people about their, their their program, why they're not you know part of the mainstream uh, parties and what they would do different. Here, parties can never get out off the ground. They don't get media attention because essentially the electoral system creates a two party system. <clears throat> so the alternative here, proportional representation, would be a big leap from the system we have in place. Um, but preferential voting is possible, and that. I was originally working on ranked choice voting, which has been used in Australia for over 100 years, been around for a long time. It's actually in the Oregon Constitution that would allow for that to be used. Um, So I was working on it a long time. Star voting is an innovation in the last five years or so uh, that, in my mind, improves upon ranked choice voting and is even better than it. So we've been working on that, trying to get instituted on the local level. Um, but I, th- I think that's really where people ought to be focusing their efforts and in trying, the elect- trying to change the electoral system to preferential voting in order to give third parties a voice. Uh, we were talking right. a moment ago about alternative media and getting other voices into the conversation. If you can get a party that can get attention because it has an opportunity actually to build uh, an electorate that isn't afraid that they're going to lose their opportunity actually to determine which party gets in power. Then they have an opportunity to build a constituency, get into mm-hmm. the mix, get media attention, all that. It's all part of an educational process. 
just to clarify for people who aren't familiar with all of these methods, both star voting and and ranked choice or these preferential voting methods you're talking about allow voters to say, OK, this is really my first choice or this is this is the person I would like the most to have, even if that person is a green or socialist workers party or mm -hmm. whatever. And then to say, OK, this would be my second choice if that person doesn't get enough votes or mm -hmm. enough points or however it works. And so then you 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 don't get yourself in a situation in which by voting for a green or whatever, you end up helping the Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say, well, you know, I'd like to have this this green, but if I can't have them, I want the Repo the Democrat. Mm -hmm. at, or, uh, you know, I'd really like to have this libertarian, but if I can't have him, I'll take the Republican. I mean, how, yeah. however it is that, that works for you. Yeah. Essentially, I would say it allows you to express your real view on the candidates without shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about now another part of this uh, thing, which is is the whole problem of the two political parties themselves. I mean, I think when we when you end up with a small number of political parties who are very entrenched and don't have don't change and don't have any possibility to change, uh, you end up with a very corrupt system. And that's kind of what we have right now. We have a system in which each party's primary goal is to get in a position to be uh, so that the corruption will flow to them, the benefits <laughs> rather yeah. than to the other guys. Um, and really, neither of them are focused on what would be good for the American people. By associating primarily or making one's primary political association be one of those two parties, you, in a sense, are contributing to that system. Um, so you've come up with an alternative, which I'm you know, involved in as well. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what that is and what your what your goal is there. Well, this this came out of my number one, my early disillusionment with the Democratic Party, or maybe not. I shouldn't say early because it took me decades <laughs> to decide that it wasn't wasn't a viable uh, vehicle for for kind of changes I thought were necessary. And then disillusionment with third party organizing because they didn't really have an opportunity to grill. Mm -hmm. So thinking about that, I'm not sure if I was provoked by an article I saw in the Jacobin or not, but the, the thought process was, if the focus in America is primarily on electoral, on elections, on electoral activity, that's what people are trained to think of as the vehicle for political change. Um, what if you create an institution that had the, the resources of a party, would work to elect people, help people get elected, but was not an actual party with a ballot line? You could work with uh, members of any party or an independent if you thought they aligned with your values to help them get elected. Uh, our system allows for something like that to, to take place. In fact, it was the way uh, there was an independent organization that took over the Democrat, Democratic Party, and that was you know the, uh, the Democratic Leadership Council that Bill Clinton was part of. So have an independent institution with its own set of values and have it help elect people, whether they're Democrats mm -hmm. or Greens or Independents, um, but also focusing on changing the electoral system so the latter right. are, are even possible, but helping candidates of whatever. So you build up the resources that a party has, um, mm -hmm. voter interest and loyalty, um, databases on the constituencies, uh, opportunities to talk to the media and reach your, your voting, uh, your voting mm -hmm. constituency, that kind of stuff. It sounds to me too as though that's that's a decent way to go. I mean, because again, we we're not going to get trapped into uh, one of these political parties because even the even the the quote third parties uh, have their issues. They're and, trapped in a party system. Yeah, they're they're yeah, and they they can't really win, and so they're trapped into a, a situation where they feel obligated, in a sense, to have to run for some office or another, oh. but don't really have. Uh, the constituency to get elected to anything. Yeah, this is what I saw in the Green Party. Every couple of years, your big effort is to get enough votes for a statewide office to keep your ballot line. And you don't have the energy to do anything with that ballot line. <laughs> you, <laughs> right. You're not winning elections. You're just trying to hold on to your opportunity to have a name on the ballot. Uh, and it just made no sense for a small party 
like that to try to run people like for U.S. senator or governor or as I did for secretary of state, you have no chance of winning. You just don't have the resources to compete on that level. You should be focusing on, I would think, uh, state state legislative offices. There you have a shot, like state house of representatives. You could actually organize in one district and get somebody in if you didn't have the the weight of the party label around your neck. Well, getting back to our um, our problem with movements, we've been talking a lot about the electoral process, and I think we both agree that the electoral process is now a capitalist-run process. Um, has been a long time. Has been, yes. <laughs> has been <laughs> perhaps through our entire nation's uh, history. Um, so is there some potential – uh, for us to break out of that, I mean, we can we have a revolution of some sort that doesn't involve the political system? Uh, uh, is that possible in the United States? I mean, it seems to be uh, uh, it sometimes seems to be possible in other countries, although we may not like the results. Uh, uh, that tends to be the the big problem is that you end up with a revolt and and once you've won it. Um, you know, you don't know what to do or you don't have, you know, the ability to do anything. Well, let's let's talk a minute what, about what a revolution actually is, because, you know, words are important. People usually think about revolution as you're taking up arms and you, you know, you march into the parliamentary building and you, you hold mm -hmm. the guns on them and say, you're done, we're taking over. Um, but what a revolution actually is, it comes from the word revolve, you know, turning. Mm -hmm. You turn from one system of uh, governance, a uh, way of organizing, in these days, an economy, and right. turn to another one. Um, so you could do that in various ways. And in the socialist tradition, I think the, the, the way that mostly relied, the tradition, the intellectual tradition within socialism that relied on a direct takeover rather than, mm -hmm. rather than working through the electoral process was what was called libertarian socialism or anarchist socialism. And that tried to empower individuals to take control of their own lives rather than always trying to gain power through the state, which uh, a lot of people early on who opposed Marx um, said, well, there's a tendency here. You take over the state and then the state takes over you. Um, whenever you put somebody into power, centralized power, you have to worry about how that's going to be used and who those people are and whether the power is going to go to their head. So is there a way that people can be organized to take power into their own hands? I think there are ways to do that, but I think it has to incorporate changes at the uh, at the political level as well, because contrary to what people usually think, capitalism is not a natural development that you know somehow grows up despite government. Like if you got rid of government, you'd have a capitalist system. It is founded on legal principles: the employment relationship, the rights of private property. All of that, the government enforces that very vigorously, as you find if you try to challenge it. Um, so how can we go about hmm, addressing that uh, without, a, without changing the political system? I think you have to do both. I think you have to organize people to create their own type of institutions, particularly what we're focusing on now is alternative media, which I think mm -hmm. is a good step. But you also have to get involved in the political system to do things like changing the electoral system. And ultimately, I think, <laughs> and this is going way far down the line, abolishing the shareholders' corporations. Corporations, if right. they have limited liability, they should not have unlimited profits. Right. Well, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody uh, running for office here is uh, espousing that, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I doubt if I would get elected if I were running. For that <laughs> no, we're, the whole we're getting it. Would be you got to tell people about it and why it's a good thing, right? Another policy that I think is worthwhile is Andrew Yang's promoting this universal basic income, and I think that would do a lot, not only to help people in, with their various needs, not just poor people who obviously need money. But people who are usually referred to as middle class people who could use the extra money to pay medical bills, student uh, tuition, um, just, you know, have a little money for emergencies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, by reducing pressure on people who work for a living, you make it more possible for them to think about um, getting involved in activity that would help change the system. 
People are not willing to think about changing the system as long as they're holding on by their fingernails. You got to give them a little breathing room. Right. Well, I think what what uh, Andrew Yang's system does, in a way, um, or could do, is uh, give us a trickle up economics rather than a trickle down yeah. economics. And and obviously, if you put the money in at the bottom of the economic scale. The people who get that money have to spend it, and they have to spend it on basic goods and services right there in their communities. Whereas if you're giving that money to a billionaire, I mean, he can buy a, a yacht in the Mediterranean or, you know, another beach house in the Bahamas. But, you know, it really doesn't necessarily help anybody here. Uh, and, and think of workers who are considering a strike for better conditions or better wages or benefits. Mm -hmm. If they have that, it's, it's a strike fund for them. They actually right. have an income coming in that will help them weather the, the, the distance on the strike a little easier than they could without it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing that worries me a little bit about Yang's uh, proposal is that uh, I think there would be a tendency to want to replace other government programs that are in place, such as mm -hmm. perhaps Social Security or various other kinds of welfare programs. And, um, and that wouldn't be such a good idea, I think. But, uh, you know, hopefully it could be enacted in a way that would protect the people who are dependent right now on government transfer payments in order to live. Yeah, you certainly wouldn't want to cut off all those things just to make the budget work out because there's a, the transition would be pretty hard to imagine that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it looks like we're getting towards the end. Or Yes, we definitely are. <laughs> so do you have anything uh, else that you would like to say while we're here? Anything, any last words? Well, if anyone's intrigued by what we've been talking about, they could, as a step, go to our website at socialadvance.org, read up a little bit about how we're trying to frame things. And think about the fact that everybody has a, who has a smartphone can be an alternative media person. You can follow what political campaigns are going on in your area, and you can record what people say, and then we can put this up on the internet in various forms, and we can learn more from the grassroots about what's going on and how to get involved. Absolutely. And while you're there at the uh, website, don't forget to take a, take a look at Oregon News and Views, which is a weekly uh, YouTube video that Alan and I make that covers Oregon News and Views, oddly enough. That's and, right. Uh, <laughs> So, Alan, thanks a lot for uh, for joining me today. Thanks again to Alan Zundel for joining me this week on Wider View. The links to the Social Advance website and to the YouTube channel where we post our Oregon News and Views videos will be in the show notes uh, at widerviewradio.podbean.com. As always, the views expressed here on Wider View are those of myself and my guests and may not reflect the views of the management of the radio station to which you're listening. Our aim is to provoke you to think outside the box and question the narratives you hear from the mainstream media and our national leaders. I hope we have succeeded. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening. <laughs>